just one second and start recording. Yeah, yeah. It's fine. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Uh, to, today we have UD. Uh, he's currently a doctoral student at the Department of Electrical Engineering, uh, TU Denmark. His research interests uh, include soft switching power converters, design automation for power electronics, and high temperature electronics. Please go ahead, UD. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. It's quite good to discuss with you about our work. Um, is the impact on zero voltage switching by splitting inductance to both sides of the transformer uh, in the one megahertz gain based DAB converter. And the presentation itself, I split it into four parts. The first is an intuitive look where I will introduce the basic idea and you will find it is actually very simple. And then the second part is the analysis, um, which is basically some calculation and simulations. And then third part experiment, of course, to verify the analysis. And finally, I prepared some conclusions to share. So the first part, uh, the an intuitive look. So we worked on this dual active bridge converter or DAB converter. And uh, for the few, for the first few slides, I will give a brief introduction on it. It's kind of the basic principle of this converter. So the topology, as you could see here, is very simple. It has two half bridges, two full bridges, and one connected to the input and the other connected to the output. And by modulating these two full bridges, it can generate two AC voltages across the switch nodes, VAC2 and VAC1 as shown here. And as we know, we cannot put directly to AC vo to voltage sources like in parallel directly. And therefore we need something in between. And in this topology, it has this uh, buffer in between, which is composed by a inductor and a transformer. And also because of this inductor, there will be a, a phase difference between the voltage and the current. And which also means that the voltage does not cross zero simultaneously with the current, which creates the possibility of zero voltage switching. And it is a very nice feature of switching mode power supplies, because as you know, it can reduce the losses in semiconductors and also reduce the noises in the converter. So our work here is focused on to characterize this zero voltage switching and especially how splitting the inductance will affect the zero voltage switching. And as you might know, in order to characterize the zero voltage switching, one of the, um, one of the most used ways is to try to analyze the waveforms in time domain to see when is the voltage crossing zero and when is the current crossing zero. And that, that will be very complicated. And in this part, which is an intuitive look, we will not look at that. Instead, we only look at this um, circuit connection. So regarding switching, and uh, in the DAB converter, it will refers to the commutation of the two switches sit in the same half bridge. And in the converter, we have four half bridges. And let's take the one on the most left as an example. As shown here, when we talk about the zero voltage switching of this half bridge, it is um, basically the resonance between the AC inductor and the two output capacitors as shown here. And if you look back, and if you look into, we look at it, we could see that the inductor current is directly goes into the joint of the capacitors to charge and discharge them. And then if we look at all of these four half bridges, since the transformer is regarded as an ideal element, so we can refer this inductance on the left to the right. So basically all of these four half bridges will have a inductive element directly connected to their switching node. And for that reason, this 
circuit of this equivalent circuit is applicable to all of the four half bridges. That is to say, um, if we do not consider or if we do not cons do not analyze it in time domain, in circuit wise, all of these four half bridges will have identical conditions to achieve zero voltage switching. But if we start to take the parasitic capacitance of the transformer into account, and then we take a look at the zero voltage switching of the half bridge shown here, we can see that the inductor is not directly connected to the joint of the output capacitors. And uh, part of the inductive current is bypassed by the parasitic capacitance, which means less current is going to charge or discharge these two capacitors. While for the two half bridges on the left, they still have the inductor directly connected to their switching nodes. Therefore, we have some kind of a, kind of a unbalance here. So we have this initial guess. Maybe it might be better to use two inductors have to have this to have the inductance split it. Therefore, all of the four half bridges will have a inductive element directly connected to their switching nodes. So this is the intuitive look. And it, it kind of gives us the idea that maybe we should split it, but how exactly? So for example, if we in total, we have 20 microhenry um, inductance, should we split it by 10 microhenry to 10 microhenry or one microhenry to 19? In order, then of course we need to do some calculation. And that will be the second part, which is the analysis. So the analysis, the objective of the analysis is to quantify the effect of this capacitance. And then we can use these numbers to design the inductance. And in the model or in the calculation, uh, we considered these elements that is drawn in this figure here. We considered the leakage inductance of the transformer, LK1 and LK2. And we considered the transformer's passive capacitance. And of course, the, the two external inductances, L1 and L2. And what we did not consider in our modeling here, and which might also be very important, is the uh, parasitic capacitance of the transformer that is that is from the primary winding into the secondary winding. We did not consider it in this modeling work, but from our recent work, it shows do have some influences. And I also attached a reference here. Uh, uh, the, this publication is not about uh, characterizing the zero voltage switching, but they are talking about the current readings in the dual active bridge converter. And in their work, they have considered the primary to, to secondary parasitic capacitance. So if you are interested, so it's kind of a good reference to you to check. So that was, so this figure here shows what we have considered in the model. And then we can start to the actual modeling. And before that, we will need to do some to do some assumptions to simply in order to simplify our work. And we assume that the two full bridges does not switch simultaneously. It is a very reasonable assumption because um, if we uh, switch these two full bridges simultaneously, meaning that the inductive link in between will be disconnected both to the source and to the load. And therefore, in principle, we have a inductor that is in open circuit, which will create um, voltage spikes across the inductor. So in practical, we should. So we neglect this operation mode in our analysis. And then we start with the actual modeling. And as you know, in the DAB converter, Although the topology is very simple, but it still have many different modulation strategies, which differentiate the many, many operation modes. And also depending on the voltage level on the input and on the output, 
the operation modes are also different. And therefore the work at the first glance, it would become really, really complicated. But it is actually not because if we are only want to characterize the zero voltage switching, there are only four basic switching patterns in these various modulation strategies, which are shown here. Um, so we defined four switching pattern, the first column one, two, three, four, different number. And the second column is the actual definition. And now let's look at the third column, which is the typical waveform. And let's take the, the switching pattern one as an example. What it says is that, um, what it says is that, um, the, the, half, the, the full bridge that is in switching is changing from a non-zero value to another non-zero value, while the full bridge that is not switching is output a non-zero value on its switching node. While switching pattern two, uh, what makes it different to, to switching pattern one is that the full bridge that is switching is its switch node is changing from a non-zero value to zero. So, and similarly, we can define switching pattern three and four. And how these four switching patterns are corresponds to those uh, modulation strategies and operation modes, it is shown in this table here. So we can see that although we have different modulation strategies and depending on uh, different parameter combinations of the phase shift angle or duty ratio, it has different operation modes, but all of the switching, switching events can be characterized by one or two of the four switching patterns. And therefore, in order to do the analysis, we don't have to um, look uh, to analyze all of the operation modes, but we just need to focus on these four switching patterns, which simplified our work a lot. So then we started to the, then we start the actual calculation. And for this four switching patterns, we grouped them into two groups, switching, switching pattern one and three and switching pattern two and four. They are grouped because um, two of them are shared the same equivalent circuit and the only difference between these two equivalent circuit is just different numbers of switches that are engaged in the resonance. So this is the equivalent circuit and then we start the calculation or simulation. And before we're talking about actual results here, I have one slide, which is an overview of what is done and what is not done. So in the analysis part, we only did an analysis on switching pattern one and switching pattern three, not on two and four. It's basically because we only have equations for switching pattern one and switching pattern three. And for in the experiments part, um, we only we did experiments on switching pattern one and switching pattern two, but not on switching pattern three and switching pattern four which is basically because if we look back into this table, we can see that whenever we have switching pattern three and switching pattern four in the converter, it will always involve hard switching. For that reason, we did not did experiments to verify these two because we're not there to stress our prototype with hard switching. And then we start the actual analysis. And we use this equivalent circuit to, to do some calculations. And this table shows the parameters that used in the calculations, which are extracted from the prototype. The COSS, which is the output capacitance of the switches, and CP1, CP2 is the parasitic capacitance of the transformer. And on the high voltage side, we have 200 volts. And on the low voltage side, we have 50 volt. And this is the plot. On the x-axis is LE1, which is the inductance, the external inductance on the high voltage side. And we have it switched from one microhenry to 19 microhenry. 
and accordingly the LE2, which is the external inductance on the low voltage side, is changing so that the, the overall inductance is maintained constant, 20 microhenry, so that the power level of the converter is more or less unchanged. And on the y-axis, we have TR, which is the time to fully charge or discharge these four output capacitors, which is also the rise time of the switching load voltage from, for example, minus 200 volts to 200 volts. And we can see that if LU1 is really small, for example, one microhenry, the rise time is 23 nanosecond. But once this inductance exceeds certain value, like two microhenry or three microhenry, then the rise time will decrease sharply. And then it basically remains constant whenever, whatever, whenever your inductance is larger than that threshold. So what is interesting to look at here is why we have this sharp decrease of rise time. And then we look at the actual waveforms, the actual resonance. We can see that when the external inductance is small, the resonant itself is not sinusoidal. It kind of have many, many, many resonances. And if we zoom in, we can see that the first resonance, it does not have enough energy to fully charge and discharge those four capacitors. And therefore it had to wait after the first wave crest, and then it is able to rise up to 200 volts. But if we now increase the external inductance a little to, my, to three microhenry, then the first resonance is, the, if the peak voltage is high enough to fully charge and discharge the capacitors and therefore it does not have to wait after the first wave crest. And therefore we have this discontinuity here, which is from 25 nanosecond to five nanosecond. And if we further increase it, we can see that the resonant becomes kind of more sinusoidal. That is to say, if we have enough inductance on the AC link, then it will block the effects from the transformer's parasitic capacitance. So until this slide, we actually shows how the splitting inductance work. That is um, the basic principle of it. And in order to design the inductance, we will need to look at how the parameter variations will change uh, this, this resonance. That is shown from this slide, and uh, which is basically the same plot, but with different transformer parasitic capacitance. And what this plot tells us is that if we do not use this splitting inductance strategy, and then the higher the transformer's parasitic capacitance, the higher the rise time, and therefore the harder to achieve zero voltage switching. And then if we decide to use the splitting inductance strategy, and then the higher the transformer's parasitic capacitance, the more inductance are needed to compensate the effect of the capacitance. And then on this slide, um, it shows the effects of power. What we get from this plot is that if we only want to guarantee ZVS at a high power level, for example, at rated power here, um, then we only need a very small amount of external inductance, then it, then the zero voltage switching will be fine. However, if we would like to guarantee zero voltage switching at a lower power level, for example, a quarter, then we will need at least, as shown here, eight microhenry inductance on the AC link. So, and then if we combine this plot and this one, we will get the influences of power and uh, the parasitic capacitance on zero voltage switching. And it is quite as expected. So the higher the power, it will be easier to achieve zero voltage switching. And if we increase the parasitic capacitance, 
the zero voltage switching will become harder to achieve. And then on the next slide, um, I have a messy plot, which shows um, how the different voltage conversion ratio will affect the switching behavior. And we will look at it one by one. So in this plot, we have six curves, three dashed line and three solid line. And let's look at these three first. So these are dashed lines and what differentiate them is the different voltage conversion ratio as shown here, V1 equal to this and V2, or it's smaller or it's larger. And they both have VR2 equals to zero, which means that this, the full bridge that is not switching is output zero volts at its switching node. And then the other full, full bridge is switching. So we can see that these, these three dashed lines does not overlap. And that will say, um, the different the voltage conversion ratio will differentiate the switching behavior. And same for the three solid lines, which means which is also differentiated by the voltage conversion ratio. But now the full bridge that is not switching is output a, a non-zero value, for example, 50 volts or minus 50 volts. And we can see these three. Um, curves also does not overlap, or these two might overlap a bit, but if we zoom in, they are not exactly the same. So that is to say the, the voltage conversion ratio still differentiate how we should split the inductance. And then we did a cross comparison. That is now the voltage conversion ratio is the same, but we have a different voltage on the switching node of the full bridge that is not switching. We can see that this one has is has much higher or has higher uh, rise time compared to this one. And uh, if we more specifically, this one is with VR2 equals zero, it means the converter is in triple phase shift modulation. While when VR2 equals to a non-zero value, it means the converter is in single phase shift modulation. And therefore, um, the conclusion here will be the modulation strategy differentiates how the inductance is split. And what is, it, what is more interesting to look at here is that, as you know, um, in the publications you might already read, um, a general conclusion is that the triple phase shift modulation will provide better um, GVS performance compared to single phase shift modulation. Um, but here in this calculation, when we use the parameters, which is extracted from our prototype, phase shift modulation is actually behaving worse than the single phase shift modulation. And in the prototype, which I will show later. We did a proper uh, component selection. And so nothing is oversized or downsized. And I think we did a proper designing of all of the passive components. And then we get this result. And I am not confident that should I push this conclusion to any high frequency DAB converters, but I do have this feeling that um, at high frequency, at least in, in our prototype, the, the output capacitance of the switches is quite comparable to the parasitic capacitance of the transformer. And that will actually affect the performance of this triple phase shift modulation and the single phase, sh phase shift modulation. And therefore, is the triple phase shift modulation is universally better than the single phase shift modulation. Um, I will put a question mark here and try to analyze more. So that was the analysis, which shows how the different parameters affect splitting the inductance. And with those analyses, we can do the selection of inductance. And here is only an example. So we have a few criteria to, to compromise in order to select the inductance. The first one 
as from here will be both the inductance should be positive. And if it's negative, and that is out of our interest here. And of course, the sum of the inductance has to be uh, maintained in order to um, uh, keep the power level of the converter approximately does not change. So then we get this that get, get this solid line, which and on which the points are the selections. And then we add in the criteria of quarantine through voltage switching. And depending on what power level we would like to guarantee the CVS, we have different range of selections. However, from this plot, you could see that if we only use a guaranteeing CVS as the criteria, and then what we got is only a range of selections. That is to say, the selections are innumerable. So with only the quarantine CVS as the criteria, we are not able to make the final decision. We need some additional design objectives. And what I used here is to just keep it symmetry. And therefore I got this selection. It's quite simple, but of course it will bring some other problems, which I will show in the experimental parts that the converter actually have a lower efficiency when I split the inductance. And just to mention that these additional design objectives can be any, which can be um, to minimize the inductor loss or to minimize the inductor footprint. And in, in my work before, I found these are quite difficult to, to do, and therefore I chose the simplest one, which is to see which is to just guarantee the symmetry. So the next part will be the experiments. And uh, still, this is an overview of what is done and what is not being done. We did experiments on the switching pattern one and two. And in switching pattern one, the converter is running at single phase modulation. And on switching pattern two, the converter is running at triple phase shift modulation. And this is the prototype, the picture. It switches at one megahertz on the high voltage side, 200 volt and 50 volt on the low voltage side. The rated power is 250 watt and use the GAN switches on both the high voltage side and the low voltage side. And as the ferrite we used is the ML91S from Hitachi Metals. And the dead time has been kept constant both for the high voltage side and the low voltage side as 25 nanoseconds. And in this picture here, we have showed all of the testing equipment used because as we are doing experiments on a high frequency converter, the test conditions does affect uh, the test results we got. And therefore in this figure here, we gave all of the part numbers of the probes we use. And these are the actual waveforms. So here in this slide, it has three sets of different waveforms, which is captured at, on the, on the left, we have the waveforms when all of the inductance is on the high voltage side. And in the middle, we have the waveforms where all of the inductance is on the low voltage side. And on the right, we have the waveforms where the inductance is split equally. So we can see that when the inductance is put, all of the inductance is put on the high voltage side, the low voltage side switches will suffer. And you could see that we have a kind of a multi-resonance here. And when we have 25 nanosecond dead time, the, the switch will be hot switching while the switches on the high voltage side will have um, zero voltage switching. And if we, now if we put all of the inductance to the low voltage side, and then suddenly, although we still have 25 nanosecond of dead time, but now the rise time is five nanosecond, but after it rises up to the 50 volts, it, it does not resonate back. It, however, the 
switches on the high voltage side is hard switching. And then once we put the inductance to both sides, all of the switches are fine. And this is the experiments on switching pattern one. And for switching pattern two, which is under which the converter is running at triple phase shift modulation, we can get the same measurements and the same conclusion, which is when we split the inductance, all of the switches will achieve zero voltage switching. While, for example, here, if we put uh, all of the inductance to low voltage side, the high voltage side switches will be hard switching. And this table here shows the efficiency comparison. And what is interesting to look at is here, when the inductance is put on the low voltage side, the efficiency here is higher than we split the inductance. So it becomes really interesting to figure out why. Um, either it's because if the switches, although the switches are zero voltage switching, it does not necessarily bring down the losses of the switches, or when we split the inductance, does it bring additional losses? And in order to answer that question, we chose to use, uh, to do some infrared measurements as shown here. So these are the thermal pictures of those two setups one with inductor on the low voltage side and the other with splitted inductance. And these figures shows the temperature on the switches on the high voltage side and the switches on the low voltage side. We can see that by splitting the inductance, by splitting a few inductance to the high voltage side, um, then the switches on the high voltage side will have a reduced temperature rise meaning that the losses inside is inside of the switches is reduced, while the losses of the switches on the low voltage side more or less does not change. So that is to say the losses on the switches does reduce. And then where are the additional losses come from? And then we look at the transformer, the temperature rise almost does not change. So it should not because of this. And then we look at the inductors on the low voltage side, does not change, but the inductors on the high voltage side, we can see that it is bringing additional losses. So because in the designing part, we did not consider it. So it actually brings down the total efficiency of the converter. And this will bring us to the conclusion where I prepared three quite solid ones. So the first is the transformer parasitic capacitors affect the zero voltage switching in high frequency converters, high frequency DAB converters, and placing inductance on both sides of the transformer can effectively extend the zero voltage range. And we also have some missing, have something that is missing, that is the rules on designing the two inductors to compromise multiple design criteria. For example, the converter efficiency, which in the experiments actually shows that splitting the inductance could decrease the efficiency. And it could also be to reduce the total inductor loss or to minimize the total inductor footprint. And that is all of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Our piece of work. Thank you. Thank you, Yudi. Very interesting work. Thank you for presenting all the results. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Uh, I'll yes. start from the bottom. Sarah has a question. Mm, can you describe the inrush current value uh, during startup of the converter? Yes. Yeah, the question is, uh, can you comment on the inrush current value uh, during startup? Inrush current. Yeah. Or do you have a starting uh, startup sequence? No, I don't. Mm. I start the converter as 
um, in open loop. So first I have a constant phase shift, then I slightly ramp up the input voltage. Mm -hmm. So I did not do any transient measurement or any startup sequences. So I cannot answer that question. Does oh. it any inrush current? How much is it? I'm sorry. No problem. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, Adrish, can you unmute yourself and go ahead if possible? Yeah, hello, go ahead. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. Please go ahead. Uh, sir, this is a very high switching frequency, one megahertz switching frequency. And you are using a core something metal you have mentioned in your specification. So I am wondering in this high switching frequency, there will be eddy current loss. So how, what is your view on this? And if we use air code type of uh, something, then we don't have that much of loss. So I want to know your view. Yes, thank you for the question. And um, for the, so in, in this converter, we have the magnetics, which is the transformer and the inductor here. And all of them, the cores are made of ferrite and they are from this company called Hitachi Metals. And the material is called this ML91S, which is a soft ferrite material. And uh, they, they, they have a, they have a technology called um, magnetic domain control, which makes their product have a very low core loss at the, this material at uh, one megahertz to, to two megahertz. And therefore this material is regarded as a optimal choice for use in uh, megahertz power switching converters. Hmm. Does that answer your question, Adrish? Any follow-up? Thank you, thank you, sir. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sarah, maybe you can unmute yourself and go ahead. Uh, you have multiple questions. Okay. Another question is, uh, Yudi, uh, does the magnetic inductor core, I think you just uh, answered that. Uh, will the transformer parasitic noticed? Okay. Mm, yeah. So I think in slide number 27, mm, uh, people yeah. have a question in Y axis, TR. So what is TR? Yes. 27. Yeah. Yes. TR, I write it here as the time to discharge these four capacitors. And mm. that is also the time for this switching node voltage VAC1 to rise from minus 200 volt to 200 volt. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is also the minimum dead time required in order to achieve the zero voltage switching. Yeah, so the question is why TR becomes constant after certain value? Yes, so if we look at this waveform, not waveform, the calculated resonant here. Mm -hmm. So when the external inductance is larger than certain value, for example, six, eight microhenry, and we can see the the way that the resonance is very sinusoidal. So at these inductance, at at these very large inductance, the the resonant, the waveform does not change that much. Mm -hmm. So. That's why we have a constant, not well, not constant, but it does not change that much the the right time. Okay, good, good. Uh, and how was the efficiency measured? You did did you use like power analyzer something like that? Yes, we use the M4L power analyzer. I think it's I don't remember the part number, but it is mm -hmm. the wave is up to I think two megahertz something. But I... Good. Uh, yeah, one more question is, zero voltage switching is achieved in primary as well as secondary. Uh, how does it, uh, how do you achieve this with respect to change in duty cycle? I think that is the question. And 
So in the experiments, when we compare how the inductor configuration will affect the zero voltage switching, mm -hmm. we have kept the phase shift uh, the same for all of the configurations. And what is mm -hmm. changed is only the inductor, like where to put them. Mm -hmm. the, the control variables, the, for example, the phase shift is, is not changed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, in slide 40, you talk about inductor footprint. Can you just elaborate on that slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So what exactly do you mean by inductor footprint? Uh, like we know what an inductor footprint is, but what are you trying to achieve here? Yes. Um, I'm also actually not sure because it's <laughs> some, something popped up in the mind. Um, it maybe is depending on applications. Uh, some in some applications, people will prefer to have less area mm -hmm. of the that is occupied by the magnetics, mm -hmm. and therefore we will need to minimize the total footprint of the inductor. Mm -hmm. And also some other applications, as you know, they might want to minimize the volume, and therefore could be also to minimize the volume of the inductors total in total. Okay. And while selecting a particular modulation scheme, uh, do you also care about switching frequency or switching frequency is fixed? Yeah, it's fixed. Hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. And one more question, how were parasitics of the transformer measured? Were they measured or calculated? How was it done? Yes, that's a, thank you for the question. So these parasitics, parasitic capacitance and parasitic, uh, no, the leakage inductance is all measured from the prototype. And uh, the, the leakage inductance is measured by, for example, the primary leakage inductance, we measure it by short the secondary side of the transformer. And then we basically get a total um, leakage inductance. And uh, then, then we basically assume that, which is also a room of sum to assume um, LK1 will equals to n times LK2, then we get this. Okay. Some so it is uh, not like uh, a frequency response approach or network and uh, you didn't do any frequency sweep? I know we did not did hmm. any. Wouldn't that, be a, wouldn't that be a more convenient way of estimating parasitic, like using a network analyzer? Ah, and... I mean the frequency response of the of the magnetics in the mm -hmm. measurement. Yes, that is we did. We we measured the impedance at different frequencies. Mm -hmm. Very good, uh, you did. I think uh, don't have any more question. So, what were the pitfalls or uh, what were the difficulties that you faced while building this stuff? Because at one megahertz, I'm assuming with GAN that too. Are there any tips that you would give for uh, engineers who are starting off with GAN? Mm. It will. Maybe it the depends. mounting, maybe for the, for the EPC GAN fits, the mounting itself, it requires some efforts. And, uh, but I think it, it can be handled. And mounting in the sense, uh, like PCB layout or mounting, how, what do you mean by mounting here? So uh, the soldering. Okay. 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 And uh, any issues with false turn on? Did you face any issues with false turn on of the FET? False turn on? Hmm. Um, no. Hmm. I didn't. And which also might be good to mention is that um, 
some of my colleagues before who, who have graduated, they did quite a lot of work on the optimal layout of GAN devices, mm -hmm. GAN switches. Mm -hmm. And so I basically follow their suggestions and it turns out to be fine. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ray. One last question from me. When you're using so many measurement instruments, yeah. I'm assuming they're differential uh, isolated, but uh, do they have any impact, one measurement equipment on the other? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. Actually, a lot. So. so how do you counteract that while taking measurement? Do you take one uh, measurement at a time? Or how do you uh solve that issue i incorporated the the, the parasitics from the probes okay, okay okay for example this one it has i don't remember but i think it has four pico thread on its input capacitance mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so just try to i i just tried to to include these parasitics in the calculation yeah. okay Thank you. Thank you, Yudi. Thank you. Yeah, I think we have one last question. Yeah. Is it possible to increase the power rating to two kilowatt and increase the switching frequency as well? Uh, is it possible or do we face any issues? This is, this is what they're asking. Scale up, basically scale up the power and also go to higher switching frequency using same. Uh, but I think what would change in that case? Um, I, I cannot answer that question because I I did not try to push this converter to higher level, but I yeah. do have some 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 let's say suggestions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my colleagues did a similar setup on the DAB converter, but as you can see here mm -hmm. uh, in this converter, or oh, you cannot see here see it here, but this converter actually have can have two phase and uh, with that full configuration it can run up to 500 volt 500 watt mm -hmm. and my colleague he works on a three phase one and also switching at one megahertz and i think he has pushed the power to over one kilowatt mm -hmm. so but i cannot um, say it will like to 200 to two kilowatt or higher frequency but uh, mm -hmm. From our measurement, we have been go up to one megahertz and at least one kilowatt. Okay, very good. And I think in this photo, you have removed all the passives, I believe, right? That's what was in the paper. In this photograph, you have removed all the passives. Yes, the passives is not shown here, but it shows in the setup, it's, which is here. Okay. Inductors and transformer and this inductor. Okay. Thank you very much, Judy. It was really very informative, very interesting work, and also highly very well presented as well. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. The paper is also very well written. I'm just going through it a couple of days back. Very good analysis. Uh, I think now, yeah. One last, uh, yeah, the presentation will be put online. So I think. Um, uh, the other questions will be answered there. So thank you, Yudi. Thank you thank for you your much. time. We greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much.